Hey, gang, it's your friendly neighborhood libertarian podcast host here, Mark Clare, on the flagship Lions of Liberty podcast. Before we get into today's program, I want to tell you about another amazing podcast you have to be checking out. I just started checking it out recently myself. It is called The Peddling Fiction Podcast, hosted by our good friend Johnny Profita, uh, who I interviewed just two weeks ago on this very podcast. Uh, each and every week, multiple times a week, I believe he's doing two days a week, sometimes more, Johnny is breaking down all of the fiction peddled by politicians, all of the phrases you hear out there that are just nonsense, like one of my favorites, our democracy is at stake. He did a whole breakdown on that one. Uh, right before the election. Uh, if you are sick of hearing your friends mock you for the ideas that taxation is theft or taxation is death, if you're Lions of Liberty and you want to get that shirt at lionsofliberty.store. Oh my God, was that a plug within a plug? It might have been. Uh, but there is more to come from Peddling Fiction. I want you to stay tuned at the end of this podcast to hear a little trailer for that show. I think you're going to really dig it. With that being said, time to start the show, friends. <laughs> To the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Claire. All right, kitty cats, my guest today is making his glorious return to this program. He was one of my very first guests way back in episode 16. That was back in 2014, believe it or not. He is the editorial director at AIER, AIER, a wonderful organization promoting economic liberty. He has written, written many books on free markets and the ideas of liberty, including his latest, Liberty or Lockdown. I'm so pleased to welcome back Jeffrey Tucker. Jeffrey, are you ready to roar? Let's go. Let's go. All right. Excellent, Jeffrey. Now, uh, like I mentioned, I, I can't even believe it. it's been that long since the f very first time I had you on the show. And of course, as I do with every single guest on that episode, uh, you did go into a little bit about how you became a libertarian, how you got into this crazy world we live in here, mm -hmm. uh, mixing it up about free markets and liberty and all these crazy yeah. things. Uh, but of course, it's been a while since that moment. And uh, we have, uh, I like to think, a couple more listeners than we did back in, in episode 15. Yeah. So maybe you could give us kind of the, the Cliff Notes version of uh, how this all started for you. How yeah, you yeah. So I, yeah, I was kind of raised by a father who's a musician. I got into music in a big way and I thought I was going to be a lifetime musician, but then the musicians got on my nerves because they're kvetch all the time because the audiences aren't there and they started hating the consumer and they're just sort of, a lot of musicians are just kind of bummer kind of people. And I don't know. So I thought, yeah, I don't want to do this. So when I, when I uh, found myself in college, I was like, yeah, what's cool. So I just kind of hopped around from place to place and found economics and the economics really appealed to me because it's like, it's like, you know, stuff you can you can do. It's like hands on, but it really matters in terms of the fate of civilization. So I guess I thought I really want to learn this. Uh, in the course of that, I kind of bumped into some more classical style economics and that sort of thing and began to read like a fanatic. And uh, in those days, it wasn't the Internet. Maybe we're better off. God, I don't know. Who knows anymore, right? These days. Uh, hey, take that back. I don't believe that. But I kind of do. Sometimes I do. Every well, other it's, funny. Hour. it's funny you mentioned the internet and whether we're better off because uh, I actually went back and just for kicks listened to that interview we did uh, way back in 2014 and one thing I thought was pretty funny that struck to me that you mentioned uh, you said it seems like we're actually getting a little more polite on the on the internet lately uh, on social media and I, that just struck me because I don't know if we can necessarily say the same looking back I, no, no 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 I, I, we can do a whole uh, podcast on uh, Jeffrey Tucker's bad predictions uh, <laughs> You know, I think uh, that might have been one of them. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wrote a whole book called "It's a Jetsons World," where I celebrated. No, it's beautiful anarchy. I celebrated the glories of Facebook. I was like, "What? What the heck?" Anyway, you know, who <laughs> who knew that you know that our friendly, happy social media companies would turn into you know monstrous, censorious, you know, data sharing? It's, it's just horrible. I, I used to think of my my iPhone as my best friend. Now I'm kind of scared of it. I'm like, well, you know, yeah. what's it going to say now? Anyway, so I. At one point, I met I met I met Murray Rothbard, and he had a big influence on me. He was like a crazy anarchist man. He he was a very interesting person to be around because he was sort of open your mind to everything, you know, all, all possibilities. And you kind of need that. You need somebody to help you think dangerously. And that was the uh, the the role that Murray played in my life, you know, just like saying, yeah, and like he he just wasn't willing to accept the orthodoxy of anything, and that that was a real help for me. And then I knew he was an anarchist. I wasn't really an anarchist, but at some point I thought, you know, I can't think of a single thing that the government does very well that needs to be done that the market can't do better. And so I asked Murray, you know, does that make me an anarchist? He said, yeah, welcome to the club, you know. So uh, so, but you know, what I've learned over the years is it's not to me enough. 
to be a libertarian. You have to figure out what you're going to do with that, you know, um, any more than to be a good pianist. You, you can just learn arpeggios and scales. No, you also have to play music. And and that's what I've kind of learned pretty early on in my career is like, I always kind of wanted to apply these ideas, not just make them abstract. And that's why I don't really get into all the big abstract. I'm not smart enough for one thing, but, but, but I like to deal with like hands-on issues. In the old days, there used to be fun things like the internet and shower heads and, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and movie reviews and that sort of thing, cultural items. And that's been the bulk of my writing, but beer know. pong. I mean, you had, uh, I think one of the first times we met back at pork fest, uh, you, you mentioned beer pong. And I think we got into a whole conversation about how beer pong was such a representation of uh, the beautiful anarchy of how people get together for different I know. events and it's skateboarding and whatever. Right. I love everything. I, I used to be a happy person back when you when we yeah, I used to be a happy guy you remember those days I used to be a like happy guy but this year has turned me into a grumpy a grumpy <laughs> a sad person you know but uh, yeah, hey we, we long for the days when you could just you know write I, about waking up and having you know whiskey for breakfast it's, I know. It's, not, it's not quite the same anymore there's more Bring those back and I, I resisted it right I mean like it was weird this year because in January I was like uh oh you know lockdowns could be coming and yeah and then they came uh, March 8th was my turning point. That was when they, they got rid of the uh, the South by Southwest. And I, th I thought, what the F is going on in this country where they can just abolish a conference like that? In retrospect, that was a disaster because there wasn't a single person who was attending that event who was in danger of any kind of fatal risk from COVID-19. So it should never have gone away. Uh, pu public health uh, authorities prevailed over, over rationality. And basically, that's the whole story of this year. So I've been chronicling it uh, with, with madness and insanity. What I've not understood, and uh, I've been overwhelmed with this, like there was a kind of a lockdown industry that was in place, and it has been in place for 15 years, and we didn't really know that much about it. I mean, I wrote about it in 2006, where I was like, here's a bunch of crazy people. I never thought that they would be like ruling the world. Uh, 15 years later, suddenly it's like, you know, this emerged like this, this monstrous beast. It took over the world and took away all human rights and the constitutions, the Bill of Rights. They zeroed out all, all philosophers, all concerns about every other death, you know, a disease aside, aside from COVID 19. We got rid of dentistry and shut down Broadway. Travel, you know, you can't go to Paris, Paris can't come to us. I mean, like, what they've done to the world in such a short period of time is amazing. And this morning, yeah, I read this article in the USA uh, Today by uh, another one of these epidemiologists who's never seen a patient or ever cured a disease or ever dealt with an actual epidemic. These are people who sit in their chairs and get paid by tax money and they r rack up you know, citations and brag about their credentials online. <clears throat> and he's like, uh, oh, we need to use the time-tested methods of of of." A hand washing. Okay, yeah, we can wash our hands. All right, fine. But then, of course, it's a litany, right? It's like hand washing, uh, mask wearing. You're like, well, I kind of, I'm, I'm sort of in favor of the human face. So I'm not sure about that one. Uh, and then uh, social distancing. And I'm mean, like, well, that's a weird world. You talk about forced human separation. I mean, woof. and then it's and lockdowns. Oh, time tested. No. This is the first time in the history of the planet Earth we've ever used this stuff. And, and he says, you need to, we need to stay away from such novel ideas as herd immunity. Herd immunity is not a novel idea. Herd immunity is part of the structure of the biological world that's been around with for, for a million years. It's truly Orwellian how he's he's referencing things that are absolutely not proven. In fact, the, the quite the opposite. We can look at lockdowns all over the world and see they definitely don't do anything at all. No. Um, and, yeah, and they're then, crazy. It's, yeah, it's and then insanity. The opposite, they'll, they'll call insanity something that is a part of actual scientists. Absolutely Orwellian. But the thing is, we have been outgunned and uh, what's that word? Gaslighted for an right. entire yes. year by this entire monstrous industry that's out there that consists of like media companies and, you know, these, these. Epidemiologists who've never seen a patient or cured a disease or or anything, that a lot of them are like have degrees in like uh, museum anthropology and this kind of stuff or 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 theoretical physics. They're just modelers, right? They're not They're basically actual. a fancier Doctor Nick from The Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> right. they don't have actual qualifications, right. of course. And, and then then you have these politicians who, I guess, you know, get a kick out of exercising power over other people, which you know the very essence of a libertarian is you don't want to do that. But I guess if you're not a libertarian, you have kind of a secret longing to. Kick, you know, shove people around, kick people around, bully people, you know, so that's a, the p politicians that I mentioned, the media. Uh, social media loves that we're just sitting around clicking on our phones or bored at home. In fact, I remember Carter Meacher from the VA, one of these, one of these lockdown creeps said, oh, don't worry about shutting the schools. The kids prefer Instagram to classroom anyway. Yeah, 
okay, you know, but how, for how long? Nine months, you know. Uh, and then you have, you know, the, the, the darker elements, right? You have, you know, the China connection with the World Health Organization about which I've written nothing, but that's actually a significant thing. You've got the role of the pharmaceutical companies, which sounds like dark conspiracy theory, but hey, you know, the Council of Europe in 2009 said that H1N1 was blown wildly out of proportion by the pharmaceutical companies. So it's not exactly a conspiracy theory. This is a well-known fact. Anyway, you've got these interlocking relationships, all these strange sectors out there that all agree that our liberties need to be smashed for as long as possible, even though they're destroying the world, destroying the arts, spreading disease, yeah, uh, the cancer screens undetected. I read this morning, there's a statistic out of UK that uh, people, God, I don't even want to say it, but like infant death is up 20%. You know, it's like, geez, what we've done to the world, there's been so much carnage uh, as a result of these lockdowns. And it's so bad that people aren't even willing to talk, talk about it. We pretend as if it hasn't happened. It has. It's very bad. All right, kitty cats, I got to take a quick little time out here to tell you about our good friends at Lauren Zotti Italy. These guys procure some of the greatest coffee you are going to ever encounter out there. They have brought premium coffee to the masses. You can find it over at laurenzadi.coffee. I will always also link to that in today's show notes at lionsofliberty.com. Uh, but these guys are amazing. Not only are they a great coffee connoisseurs bringing amazing coffee to our fans out there, they are also amazing entrepreneurs. They're also fans of the show, patrons of the show, but they also help other people uh, set up their own coffee businesses, setting up their own coffee shops. They help people uh, setting up equipment, getting financing. They're really trying to help bring back those classic coffee shops that were around, I don't know, probably when I was growing up. I didn't drink coffee when I was growing up, let's be honest. But I do now. I need coffee. I need coffee to get through interviews like today with Jeffrey Tucker. You got to have energy to keep up with Jeffrey, that's for sure. Uh, but I want to encourage you to check out everything these guys are doing and to use their services. If you are a fan of coffee like I am, you got to check out Lauren Zotti Italy at laurenzotti.coffee. Do not forget to use discount code LIONS for 10% off your order. That's discount code LIONS at checkout. <laughs> One of the things that's more frightening, even than the fact that there's all this stuff with the government, uh, you know, issuing orders, diff issuing different mandates, uh, the big fancy epidemiologists coming out and just saying we have to do lockdowns, lockdowns, lockdowns. I right. think even more frightening than all of that is the change that I've seen in my fellow humans around me. Mm. Uh, maybe it's different depending on where you live in the country. Here in Los Angeles, I'd say it's a maybe a 50 Maybe even more. Maybe it's 50, 60, 70 percent, maybe, of people who are so fully have so fully bought this narrative, the narrative that it's almost like everyone is stuck in time on March 8th when everyone was afraid, uh, when when things were shutting down, uh, yeah. when everyone was th assuming yeah. this is the deadliest. We yeah. were seeing just people die by yeah. the hundreds in Italy. But we're if we're looking at things rationally, we, we should be looking at things much differently than then at this point. But it feels like everyone around me is stuck in time there and is still so afraid of this virus that you are now the enemy if you are not complying, if you're yeah. Yeah. out against lockdowns if you don't want to wear a mask walking your dogs as i refuse to do because that's right. ridiculous right so you're saying that people are actually afraid to get covid I, I don't i mean that's the funny thing because i'm not sure if they're actually afraid to get covid or they have they it's some something some yeah. weird psychological thing where they ha they have to act as if they are they have to support mm. everything that's going on because mm. they have just bought the narrative so much because yeah. i also see some of those same people not actually acting that out necessarily in their daily yeah. lives you know maybe yeah. you'll, you'll see them going out and hanging out with friends without masks and acting like things are normal and then they, later on they'll be advocating the masks and advocating yeah. the lockdowns yeah yeah i i kind of agree with what you're saying i think what i'm hearing you saying is that that there's a general atmosphere of fear and loathing. And you can parse that onto various pieces that they're overlapping. One is maybe fear of disease. Maybe one, another is a fear of giving the disease to somebody else if you get it asymptomatically or something like that. But there's also uh, the fear that comes with what the hell has happened to us, right? Afraid of the politicians, afraid of your neighbors, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> afraid of what's, what's going to happen next, you know? So it's, it's all mixed up. And, you know, I've, I've been reading recently a lot of studies on so-called long, long haul COVID because, you know, when it was, it's, I, I'm sorry to get a little bit uh, paranoid here, but, you know, by, I, by, I think anybody paying attention should be more than a little paranoid <laughs> at this point in November 2020. In, in early April, the Imperial College of London came out with a demographic study of exactly who's at risk from this. It turns out, you know, the risk to old people is a thousand times greater than it is to young people. For, you know, if you're healthy and under the age of basically 60, it's it's, it's hardly a well, 50. It's hardly a disease at all. Mostly it's symptomatic. If you're a little older than that, if you're like my age or whatever, you could be down for a couple of days with sniffles or something. Um, 
but and the only people for whom this is actually a great risk have comorbidities over the age of of eighty, and 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 so so you have to like look at this from a heterogeneous point of view. None of which you know the models didn't do that. They hom- homogenize all risk across the population. The average age of death around the world was eighty two. In the U.S., it's average. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, which is four years older than the than the lifespan. Uh, and then if you start to bring bring that stuff out, people just say, well, "What you don't care about grandma?" So it's interesting. You don't care about old people. I mean. I know, I know, but Jesus, yeah, but, but it was interesting. You, you're kind of like we're stunned when you hear that. Because April first, the Imperial College of London announced this. Basically, they thought that the average risk of fatality, fatality risk for for cases was like uh, ninety uh, nine point uh, uh, two or something like that. But it turns out it's like it's approaching uh, the the case fatality ratio. I should say, yeah, the case fatality ratio is like. Like um, uh, uh, zero zero point one percent, you know, or zero point two percent, and and falling, and the uh, so what it means is that for ninety nine point nine percent of the population, this thing is not a, a risk at all. But, and and we knew that we knew approximately that. Oh, and the CDC points out that among those who have died uh, with COVID, only six percent of those died exclusively from COVID. But even they were, you know, pushing it in terms of lifespan. You know, so so I mean, it's very interesting when you actually examine the data. So what happened to me is on like April, somebody like third, I wrote an article, and you can look it up. It's just the most ridiculous article I ever read. I thought, oh, now we have the data on the demographics. It turns out that there's not homogeneous risk throughout the whole population. For most people, this is not even a disease at all. If you get it, you get the immunities. Mostly, you get it asymptomatically. You know, the the facts matter, right? And so when the Imperial College study came out with this, the Imperial College came out with a study based on, on Wuhan, on, on the Diamond Princess, on the MBA, all the available evidence, and revealed this, I thought, oh, now it's going to be over. So I wrote an article called, With Calm Comes, uh, no, With Knowledge Comes Calm and Openness. <laughs> Is this, oh, do you have to add this to the list of bad predictions? <laughs> yeah. And I thought it would be on the cover of the New York Times. It turns out I was the only one who wrote about it, you know? And so, right. and so, so even here we are now. And so this guy, I mean, I was getting back to the She Had to Say Today article from this epidemiologist at Falk, Falcon University or something like that. Anyway, he's like, oh, the Great Barrington Declaration says that the risk is much higher for uh, for for much older Americans with comorbidities than it is for young people. And that might be true in terms of hospitalizations and death. All right. So, okay. Is, what do we care about? We care about hospitalizations and death. All right. Yeah, so yeah. What, you, what, what matters yeah. more than that? Comma. But that might be true when it comes to hospitalizations and death period. But all right. What's here's next? all this other stuff we're going to talk about anyway. Yeah. And so and so what's the, what's the but? Well, the but is is uh, long haul COVID. That's when you get COVID. But I don't know. You know, God, I had it, and ever since I had it, I mean, I don't know. I've been kind of foggy headed. Uh, been drinking more than usual. Uh, I haven't been looking forward to the day. My memory's failing me. I'm kind of depressed. It's like, oh well, that's got to be COVID. Well, think about the things I just mentioned to you. Where does that come from? How about having your human rights completely uh, taken away? You think that might get you a little down on the dumps? You can call that I'm long not having haul. a job or any hope for the future. <laughs> I lost my job. I lost my business. I can't see my girlfriend. Uh, uh, I can't attend my mother's funeral. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, that'll that'll get you down the dumps. That'll, that'll cause some uh, health problems. So they're what they're doing is they're attributing all the health problems associated with lockdowns to COVID and calling it long haul COVID. And and so this is you know, and there are like seventy five studies about this. I think I've read them all, and I, I can characterize them all exactly this way. Not to mention the fact we don't actually have a long haul to think about yet. But what they're doing is examining people who recover from COVID and saying, "How's your life?" And they're like, "Huh." I Life sucks. It's pretty shitty. <laughs> gotta be gotta be honest with you here. Like, all right, well, that's the long term <laughs> consequences of COVID there. Uh, uh, Je- Jeffrey, I want to I want to kind of dig in and uh, tick back the clock a little bit right. towards uh, something you've talked about a lot, something you've looked into a lot, and that mm. is the the origins of what we're mm. seeing right now. Because this obviously yeah. didn't come out of nowhere. The fact that one day we're living normally mm. and quite literally the next mm. day uh, we're told, at least how in here in Los Angeles, we're told, all right, yeah. can't go to work. Uh, you got to be six feet from people. You can't do any gatherings. You can't be you can't be with your friends. You can't do all, all this overnight. And you're seeing it everywhere around the globe. 
with different variations, but essentially yeah. all saying the same things. Six feet social distancing. Everybody's got to wear masks. Uh, this litany of little things that, yeah. I mean, this committee didn't just organize on, you know, mm. March 7th or, mm. you know, and, and get all this stuff together. So what is the origins of all of these policies that we're actually seeing play out in yeah, real life d- right now? Yeah, I'll just give you a brief a brief thing. So about t- 20 years ago, it became very fashionable to solve all human problems with computers. And that was the idea. Agent-based modeling, you name the problem, we've got it, right? Bill Gates got really involved in that sort of thing. I think even to this day, he's confused about the difference between a computer virus and a biological virus, by the way. <laughs> he Maybe that's we, what he thinks we have. Maybe he thinks we have a computer virus. Yeah, I think it's like, oh, concerned. well, you know, I've got a virus. And well, that's why tried- he wants the microchips to vaccinate us, because <laughs> he's going to put the, the cure to the computer virus in us. you got a virus? What, weren't you using Kapersky? You know. <laughs> I, I'm going to download McAfee for this one. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to send McAfee a tweet on this one. So these guys began to take over uh, uh, public health and, and disease. Not not take over, but they were they were out there, you know. And and my favorite epidemiologist, Sinatra Gupta from Oxford, who's like this philosopher king. She's the Hayek of ep- epidemiology. She blasted them twenty years ago. She's like, "You people are insane." Uh, anyway, so what Even happened? Back then, she was saying that because oh yeah yeah really yeah twenty years ago she was like, wow. "You people are nuts. You're gonna you're gonna solve a, 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 a difficult evolutionary bio, biological problem, you know, that's been around for a million years with computers." Uh, you know, she, she was like, I don't know what happens, but I don't think it ends well. Anyway, that was her article, and she was right about that. But anyway, so five years later, this so, oh, then H1N1, uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, SARS-CoV-1 comes out in 2002, 2003. It's a very serious disease, killed like half of the people who got it, right? It never really kind of came to the U.S., but it did vex uh, certain parts of China, of China and the Far East and Taiwan in particular. And, but it, it was very deadly. And the thing you learn about viruses is that really bad viruses to, to kill too quickly, like the early scenes of the gladiator in the movie. <laughs> and, 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 and so they don't last because they can't find a host because the hosts are dead. So they burn out really quickly. But when SARS-CoV-2 came, uh, CoV-2 came along, a lot of people thought it was going to be the same thing. You know, because they don't. A lot of these lockdowns don't actually understand viruses. I mean, there's this inverse relationship between severity and prevalence. So the more you the virus spreads, the less deadly it really is. Anyway, point is that George Bush was by now an apocalyptic president because he had 9/11. He invaded all these countries. He enjoyed destroying things. Whatever. He's like, okay, what happens when bioterrorism comes? So he said, let's have a White House conference. So in, two, in November of 2005, he commissions the VA, the State Department, uh, the CDC, and various national laboratories, including the one Sc- Scandia National Laboratory in in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I guess it is. Uh, no, is it Albuquerque? Yeah, I think it's yeah. What's it, yeah. And 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 that's where Robert Glass and his charming daughter, uh, Laura, 14 years old, you know, came up with this great solution to what to, how to do with the virus in the future. She was kind of a, a germaphobe and was afraid of cooties. So she drew up this map where everybody in school like stayed away from each other as far as part as possible. And so Robert is like, oh, you're a brilliant child. And so he put that through his models. This guy was trained in theoretical physics and modeling. So he arrives at the White House with a bunch of fellow lockdowners like Carter Meacher from the VA and the rest of these freaks, including Neil Ferguson from, from uh, uh, oh, and, and Mark Lipsitch uh, from Harvard and, and some of these guys. And, and, and they arrive with all the doct- the actual practitioners, the doctors, people who have been eradicated smallpox, like people who deal with real viruses and study medicine and, and actual uh, immunology, virology, and that kind of stuff. And they arrived at the White House, and George Bush and his you know, friends are sitting around in lounge, lounge chairs waiting for the presentation. So the doctors go first. And the big question is, what happens when the pathogen comes? And the doctors are like, well, you know, it's complicated. You know, every pathogen is slightly different. So you have to figure out, you know, is it coronavirus? Is it flu? Um, you know, is it more like polio? I mean, it could be like HIV, you know. So you have to figure out who the who the vulnerable populations are and kind of send out a warning to them. And then, you know, get some therapeutics and, you know, work on a vaccine if it's available. Vaccines can take 10, 15 years, you know. So Bush has already fallen asleep. It's like, this is the most boring presentation <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. Is so any pretzels? <laughs> What's going on here? Where's my dog? And so the next presentations are like the modelers, like lights out, 
3D imagery, moving grass, agent-based modeling. And now Bush is decoration. fascinated. He's like, ooh, wow. Oh, yeah, this is great. Cool. There's travel <laughs> restrictions, abolish school, you know, close <laughs> businesses, keep people apart. The virus will drive down the R naught. You know, we'll find out what the R naught is from looking around, you know, and we'll drive the R naught blue one, and then we'll be able to find a host and the virus will be suppressed that way. With thanks to our computer modelers. And he's like, now that. That's some amazing shit right there. So <laughs> this is right. And so he goes to CDC, you know, this conference went on for like a couple of days. So he goes to CDC, he goes, you know, I think these guys are pretty smart. Why don't you write, write stuff about them for, and into their, into your, into your virus plan. CDC. Do the computer like, thing. Do the computer yeah, thing. Yeah. Like yeah. That. Yeah. I like that. So the CDC is like, all right, this is insane. All right. Cause like nobody believed it, you know, cause it was just complete nonsense. And, and Donald Henderson, you know, this great, Small packs of pox eradicator from the old days, you know, pretty old, comes out of retirement to blast these people, writes, you know, massive treatises against them, show these people are crazy. If you do this, he says, you will cause a catastrophe. That was the closing words of, of his great treatise from 2006. Well, anyway, they prevailed thanks to George W. And the CDC wrote in some lockdown uh, plans into their uh, pandemic planning in 2006. So Avian bird flu comes along that year. They're like, hey, can we use it now? They're like, no, uh, uh, because like we tried, but the things the thing about avian bird flu is like it only gets like bird sick and that's it. <laughs> so that was the problem. 2009. Can't shut down the schools? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. The people are always panic about about birds getting flus. There was a panic in two thousand and uh, two thousand in uh, nineteen twenty nine when a bunch of parrots, you know, were sick, and we we abolished the importation of parrots from South America. It was, anyway, that's another story. But so so it didn't happen in two thousand six. Uh, but 2009 came out. That was interesting. H1N1, right? So that was the same virus, the same class of virus as as the original Spanish flu of 1918, which is a terrible thing. And so they thought, ah, this is our chance. Well, H1N1 was kind of a big deal in Europe. And and they were distributing vaccines all over the place and like you know, hopping around mad. And all the public health authorities were like, oh, we got to lock down. This is a disaster. But it turned out H1N1 2009 wasn't any worse than uh, it was actually a mild flu. It wasn't any worse than a mild seasonal flu and, and be quickly became endemic. This country, we were too concerned about like house prices to worry about some <laughs> yeah. stupid flu. We had a housing crash to deal with. So uh, there's a flu too? Okay. So they didn't have the chance then. So they had to wait 10 years. You got to think about it from the point of view of these guys. Oh, meanwhile, all these epidemiologists get high paying positions and uh, departments. So they've got their journals. They've got their conferences. They're getting flooded with hundreds of millions of dollars by Bill Gates. It's like, yeah, do some more computer modeling. So they all got to know each other. They became this kind of friend network. And then they have graduate students. Why don't you go into epidemiology? But I don't know anything about medicine. It doesn't matter. So yeah, that's, <laughs> that's not a requirement. <laughs> down. Yeah, Come right. On. No, we got silly. public health. We got to, I can put you head of the Department of Public Health. It'll be awesome. But I don't know anything about it. No, no, no. It's like, so, so anyway, so relax. Just, come just relax. Drink, so, come it's all going to be fun. So all these people are like hanging out for 10 years. Like, when's our chance? When's our chance? When's our chance? When's our chance? Oh, uh, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, look at Wuhan. Oh man, we got some shit show in, in Northern Italy, you know? And so just in the course of like a week, it was like unbelievable. These came, people came out of nowhere and the, now's our time. Now's our time. Let's go. You know, let's, 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 uh, this is okay with the video. It's all okay. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, now's our time. And so they, they got, got every public health official in the country just whipped up in a state of frenzy. And then you had Neil Ferguson with his predictions of millions and millions of deaths. New York Times, February 27th, had a podcast out in which they predicted that 6.6 .6 million people would die in this country from COVID-19 unless we shut down society. New York Times. I mean, I used to love that podcast. That was an outrageous and irresponsible. I looked up the guy who did the podcast, the great expert who predicted 6.6 .6 million of death. His name is Donald um, McNeil. He has a degree in rhetoric from Berkeley. You know, so this rhetoric. is rhetoric. Yeah. So this is what we're talking. These people we're talking about. These people who wrecked the country. And the thing is, what they what they enacted between, say, the March 8th and March 16th was so egregious, so unconstitutional, so contrary to all human dignity in the Bill of Rights and American tradition and everything else. And they've created such an unbearable uh, calamity of suffering and death and despair that they can't even admit it.
And here we are, you know, middle of November, and 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 they're just still burrowing down. Oh, it was the right thing. Oh, if we hadn't done that, it would have been millions uh, to die, and so on. So, I think there's going to be hell to pay. That's my short story. I hope there's hell to pay because I, I don't th- see any way to look at what's been going on other than crimes, crimes being committed by the people perpetrating these lockdowns, per- p- crimes that are you know being perpetrated by people that are taking people's livelihoods away, taking people's lives away, literally ruining lives. And more so than even I, I guess for many of us in Western society, it's 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 often an inconvenience. Uh, it sucks. We're depressed. We're sad. Uh, we can't see our friends like we used to. There's people wearing masks everywhere. It's so weird. I can't see people's faces. I can't understand people half the time because I realize how much of our communication is our is visual is actually like i yeah. realize how much we read people's lips and actually oh, just like I, read I, their into it you know the i agree in their face i watched television the other night which i haven't done since february and for you know for the election returns all that kind of stuff like because i i like an idiot got sucked into that fiasco like a lot of other people and yeah what does it mean so the guy's got broadcasting and, right. and you're like wait what huh what do you say what so I had to like flip around to find a station with people with mouths. <laughs> it's crazy. And now we're probably going to see like, all right, there's going to be mask TV networks and no mask TV network. It's going to be like the, the new right or left. Are you a mask person or a non-mask person? And it's very strange, too, because I, I live in uh, Berkshire County in Western Massachusetts and which voted 82 percent for Biden. But uh, and so everybody does the thing you talk about in Los Angeles. There's it's like mm-hmm. it's like disease theater. Right? Right, right. And so one of the strangest things is this uh, human separation stuff, you know, um, so everybody's hopping around uh, every story you go to. People are like bunking them from place to place. And if you get close to somebody, like, how about you want to stand close to me? They're like, no, no. And they hop away. Stand away from me. But, but Even uh, when I'm just walking around the street, like walk, out walking my dogs, maybe it's because I don't wear a mask doing that because that's silly. Uh, I see people, people start to see me walking towards them and you'll see them visually like, all right, I'm going to cross the street now. I'm going to get away from this oh, isn't crazy it just person just walking around breathing. Are you understand what they're doing? They've they've dismantled normal uh, society, you know. And and this is in my and, neighborhood. These are people I you used to say hello, how are you? Hi. How, now that's gone because we have to be you know across the street from each other. Apparently, uh, we've adopted this new uh, social ritual because the go- government told us to. I marvel at it. Right? It took it took Catholicism like a thousand years to get people to believe in transubstantiation and holy water. <laughs> But it, but it only took, you know, like two or three months for a government to convince us that if we get closer to six feet to another person, we're going to get a disease. <laughs> the state is very powerful. Did you know that? I mean, I we've all learned a lot of things. The government's very powerful. Uh, there's a lot of people that are uh, not only willing to go along with it, but are very excited about it. You know, some people just like lack drama in their lives, you know, the sort of bourgeois barbecues and baseball and Broadway life, you know, sort of boring. So how about we have pretend to have a huge uh, murderous disease and all obey some new mandates. And then that gives us a meaning and a mission. And exactly. It seems to be becoming the new meaning for so many people that and maybe this is a reflection of just our society overall. Maybe people have lost meaning so much that now maybe they found this thing where they're told, well, no, if we just have to do these things. We can beat this. We can do this together. That's why we all have to wear the masks. That's why we all have to sacrifice. That's why we all have to deal with maybe not working for a few months or maybe not working for a year or maybe having our lives ruined or maybe we have to not get our cancer screenings because that's what the sacrifice we all have to make together to beat this thing. And everyone's acting like they're going off to war fighting the Nazis. They and- do think that. And, and it's ridiculous because you can't suppress a virus, right? I mean, you just can't, you can't make a virus go away by by causing it to get bored uh you know uh it's like a virus who shows up like, well everybody's wearing a mask and social distancing i guess i have to find some other host somewhere that's not the way viruses work uh there doesn't seem to be any relationship at least that we can tell empirically between lockdowns and virus mitigation at all and let's say you could actually do it let's just say uh which you can't, you can't but let's just say you could actually cause the, the human population to, to decline to get the new virus that's a very bad idea because what you've done is create a bunch of naive, naive immune systems. You are guaranteed to get somebody worse and you get wiped out. This is what used to happen to uh, tribes in the old days that, that didn't travel, weren't integrated with the rest of the human community. Everybody's healthy, healthy, healthy until a, a very minor pathogen comes along and boom, universal death instantly. So you don't want a naive uh, uh, immune system like they're creating in Australia and New Zealand right now. 
uh, you actually need to be exposed to pathogens so that your immune system, something about which we've heard almost nothing for the last nine months, so that your immune system can build up uh, uh, defenses against it so it can be incorporated into uh, the human population. And let me just point out something that I found. So I've, we've all learned a lot, but my great teacher of the last nine months has been Sunetra Gupta from Oxford. She makes this most extraordinary point. She says, and by the way, she's not like some sort of capitalist libertarian ideologue. As far as I know, right. she's a commie. I don't know. But but she makes this extraordinary point. She says, you know, that <clears throat> after World War I, uh, we had massive trade and we had huge amounts of travel because we had the technology and we created this global uh, uh, global economic, social, cultural structures. So you could go to Europe and come back and we democratized travel and, and had huge amounts of immigration all over the country. So that meant we were exposed more than, than any people in the history of humanity. You following this argument? I think it's, I think it's an amazing insight. Yeah. And she said, as a result, uh, humanity that's alive today has better, stronger, more powerful uh, immune systems than than any people in the history of the world. And this is one of the reasons that people live so long is because we're so, we're so st strong now. Um, and and it's, it's a major reason for the increase in lifespans, which never occurred to me before. Um, so it was global capitalism in her analysis that has contributed uh, mightily to, to our immune systems is getting so good. And that has itself contributed to prosperity. So the, what she, Posits is some very interesting interlocking relationship, a mutually, how would you say, uh, dependent relationship between uh, capitalism and and strong immune systems that works together in a beautiful evolutionary way to to cause better and more human thriving. I think that's like a brilliant insight worthy of a book. Yeah, and th I mean that's and what's scary about that is that it seems like that the powers that be or what have you, the people that are, are trying to kind of steer the conversation on right. on these and many other matters, all want us to reverse course the other way. They yeah. want less capitalism and they want less people interacting. They want us all on Zoom calls, all on our phones, not actually traveling the globe anymore to, to interact with each other, not actually you know send you know physically going to different places. Now, oh, we can just go on a Zoom call and go on a, a virtual tour of, of France. We can oh, go on a virtual tour dangerous. of of this and that place. It seems like the, the the goal seems to be pushing us to a point where we basically just stay in little cubicles all day and text and zoom each other. Right, and like douse and, on maybe and, too. Yeah, and douse douse ourselves with with hand sanitizer all the time. You know, right. like that lady the other day at CVS. So she was dripping with hand sanitizer. It was disgusting. It was falling all over the floor. Uh, there's another strange thing about lockdowns that they recreated the strange feudalism. I don't know if you've been to a. Uh, I was in a restaurant the other day in New York, and once uh -huh. you get it in, in or out. No, inside. I was in. I was in. And you're inside there in New York. Now? Yeah, yeah. You got to give your name and number. You know, Mickey Mouse one two three four five, and they're like, oh, oh wow. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, we still can't have any indoor dining here in California. Well, they've still, got it. Well, yeah. we can sit yeah. right outside, but I guess you can't really do that in New York uh, in like November, yeah. December. So I, I was in. I was indoors, but you know, and so you sit down, you take off your mask, and next thing you know, it's revelry, and you know, the bourgeoisie are having fun. It's just felt fabulous, and we're all just enjoy each other. It's felt kind of like normal life, and then the wait staff comes, rubber gloves. <laughs> mask it's like face shields uh, you know isn't this something it's like it's like and this is the required so these lockdowns have created this weird caste system where we have the working class out there you know which we we stigmatize you know and get make them wear costumes like the diseased you know mm -hmm. whereas we the bourgeoisie can sit and eat and and have our chicken fingers and our and our martinis but the working classes that, who bear the bulk of the uh, the burden of her, herd immunity because they can't get in zoom calls and live in bubbles they have to be out there working right so we force herd immunity on them we force them to get, to get covid to protect us you know so we can live our good lives it's disgusting like like one of the things that that we believe as modern people is in things like equality and democracy and freedom for everybody, like equal rights, not under lockdowns, not under lockdowns. The bourgeoisie get to lock down and, and live on Zoom and 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 consume Netflix uh, while getting our groceries delivered by the workers and the peasants. You know, have to expose themselves but to disease. What, what you're saying here reminds me of uh, not long after the lockdown started. I, I couldn't believe this, I, but there was a uh, you know celebrities were kind of posting like things about wearing masks and you know social distancing and stay home, stay safe was the big thing at least out here in L.A. And uh, I saw a video posted by Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
Schwarzenegger, where he is in a hot tub in the backyard of his mansion with two little tiny ponies that he owns racing around and having fun playing with each other while he's saying, hey, everybody, just remember, we've got to stay home. We've got to stay safe. You've got the social distance. I mean, like, well, it's easy for you to say, pal. You're you're <laughs> sitting there in your hot tub with your freaking ponies. Of course it's fun yeah, yeah. for you. This yeah, is not the life everybody lives. Who brings the, the pony feed? You know, who's taking care of the horses? It's, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the workers. It's, it's Someone the workers, in a mask, probably. It's the workers and peasants, you know? I mean, this. so here's what's interesting. It's like the New York Times said in some of the like uh, March, we need a medieval style response to COVID-19. Well, we got it. Now we've got the lords and the, you know, the manor estates on the hill with their Zoom calls on Netflix while the, the peasants are out there bearing the burden of herd immunity, getting COVID and, 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 and doing all the work for us. And also, you know, we got rid of dentistry at the same time. So yeah, it's very much like the Middle Ages. We did have, we did have a medieval response to COVID. And this is the result. We created a caste system the diseased, the undiseased. And then we dare to stigmatize them. Wait, you got COVID? Go home. You know, like, what the hell? How dare you? you you're a sinner. Get out of my face. Get out of, get out of our community. This is what we do with students now. If they test positive, nope, get out, get out your stigma. Oh, and here's your scarlet letter C uh, to wear in your shirt, you know? One of the strange things, too, I mean, it doesn't seem, uh, as always with this stuff here lately, nothing, like, there's so many different versions of reality going on. There's a version of reality where we can't have kids interacting because, you know, they can't go to school because they're going to get a disease and then bring it back home to grandma, I guess, eventually. There's Which this other true. reality where an NFL player can get uh, can get tests for, for COVID, uh, like, you know, Matt Stafford of the Detroit Lions just tested positive for COVID-19. And no longer, no one is concerned about his health, mind you. No one, there's not one person saying, oh my God, is he going to be okay? Oh, is he, is he going to, is he sick? No, they're just saying, okay, you just got to go, go home, uh, produce three positive tests and you can come back and play and you're good. It's like, wait a minute. So what are we even, why are we doing any of this if we're not even a little concerned when, when these famous concerned. athletes get, That's get right. this disease? They're fine. That's right. You were exactly right about that. It's the same thing with football, apparently. You know, it's like people worried uh, not about, oh, is he going to die? No, it's like, well, I guess we're going oh, to have to. We got to get those three positive, three negative tests and then he can come back. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, we had to do without this guy for two weeks. Yeah, I remember the earlier. Remember when Tom Hanks got it? They said, "Oh my God, oh my God, America's greatest, your favorite guy in the world is about to die from COVID." Well, he didn't. Yeah. And uh, and so on. It went after a while. The media stopped reporting this stuff because they realized it was getting ridiculous. And uh, you know, then Trump got it. You know, and I was pretty sure he'd be down for a couple of days. You know, based on what I know from COVID nineteen, then he'd be back. And he was hilarious when he came back. He's like, "I'm immune," which is <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, then yeah, maybe oh, who knows. And then when Chris Christie got it, you know, we I had mean, heard I think that's the ultimate test. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, how, we, how can we take this seriously anymore? <laughs> this jumbo sized obese man is totally fine. I, I, I'm letting you talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you, I'll be the I'll be the bad guy who's. who's <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought him up first, but I mean, we're, we're seeing over and over that even even some people that should be or that we formerly thought would have been in the category of most at, at risk, like someone of the type of person of Chris Christie or Donald Trump, yeah. even they are just fine and brush it off after a couple of days. No, you know, and sometimes I wonder, you know, because I, I explained the history of all these lockdowners and the modelers and, you know, how they had this lust for control. Sometimes I wonder if they picked the wrong disease, you know? It's like, like of all things to, if this were Ebola, you know? Okay, maybe. Um, and I don't believe it in even there, but, but, but SARS-CoV-2 turns out to be really mild, Really Do you widespread. Think they're disappointed. Do you think they're going? Oh man! I, I think that, I think they just chose. Yeah. They ch they just picked the wrong the wrong uh, the wrong virus. You know, if to deploy their plans because that's why they have to continue with this long COVID thing. They have to continue to keep all the alarm up and stuff like that. I think I think uh, the inner circle of that of the lockdowners they must be pretty worried today because uh, although yeah, I mean, there's a lot a lot of people die, but once you adjust for population size. 68, 69 was much uh, more deadly than than SARS-CoV-2. And they had Woodstock then. They had Woodstock and 57, 58, which, you know, the New York Times said, well, we got a virus, just, you know, just kind of, you know, if you get sick, go to the doctor. That was it. Mm -hmm. um, and and 42, uh, I'm sorry, 48, 52 with polio. Now that was a nasty, nasty virus. And you know we've we've lived through a century of, of horrible things. SARS-CoV-2 is just not one of them, and yet they destroyed the world because of it. They they automatically defaulted the idea this is going to be the end of the world, 
and and it just it just hasn't been. So I don't know what they're going to do with themselves. I there's I think there's going to be hell to pay. I really do. I just I think there's going to be investigations, and there's going to be commissions. We're going to be thinking about this for the next five or ten years. I mean, the damage has been done, and uh, I don't know. I mean, I. I, I, there's a lot of investigations that need to go on. A lot of it has fallen on. I don't know if you follow the work of the American Institute for Economic Research. We're I doing, sure a, do. Come on. We're, we're doing a ton of the, uh, the deep background on this. I just published a story the other day you on tell the, us about it as well. I love to hear you speak a little bit about the, the great Barrington Declaration. Well, so that was an interesting guys, case, together, right? Well, yeah. Because I've been screaming about this. I'm going to come out of the book and this and that. And I, I wrote this, this Harvard epidemiologist named Martin Kuldorf, who turns out to be quite good friends with, uh, all the Swedish, uh, epidemiologists who didn't lock down, you know? <clears throat> and he started tweeting things like, oh, well, we shouldn't lock down. I was like, well, that's very interesting, a guy from Harvard. So I just invited him over to the house. I said, he must be the loneliest man in the world. He goes, yeah, you're right, I've lost all my friends. I said, well, come over here. So I invited a few people, we just hung out for the weekend and had, to, had a good time, went to the side. Six feet apart, I hope. What you, yeah, you're right. <clears throat> and, um, and then after that, he called me up and he said, you know, this is, this is, this is serious. We need to do something big. So I'm going to call Jay Bhattacharya and we're going to get Gupta from, from, from Oxford over here and, and we're in with a good New York Times reporter and a few other uh, good reporters. And we're going to have a, a meeting. I said, well, this can happen. He said, next week. I don't know how that happens. He goes, yeah, you watch. By Friday, everybody was here, right? And we we're all hanging out. And uh, we had the ca cameras rolling. They signed that they wrote the declaration, which is all it turns out to be, I think, less than a thousand words, you know. But it was basically principles of public health combined with cell basic cell biology, boom, done, signed. Next thing you know, we had a half a million signatures and the world press. We're on what, like week four of this? And there's still sto stories. It's The Guardian denounced us again, <laughs> again this morning. So it's been a while. Sure everyone's uh, calling you, you know, crazy, uh, crazy anti-science, et cetera. Conspiracy uh, yeah, yeah. But then a lot of people, you know, but it's also galvanized an anti-lockdown movement around the world. So it was the first real big breakthrough, something really important is happening this afternoon. Um, the American Medical Association won't surprise you, or maybe it would, but has been like weirdly pro lockdown throughout this whole thing. Like their that doesn't surprise me, YouTube uh, channel for the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was like they're interviewing Fauci every 10 minutes or something, you know, and um, for the first time uh, today, they're hosting a debate between Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford and Mark Lipsitch of uh, of Harvard, and that takes place uh, in about in about an hour and a half from now. And this will be the first time in nine months that on that venue they would have allowed uh, a person who wanted normal social functioning to have a platform. So I suppose you call that progress. But I, I feel like <laughs> we've been we've been gaslighted and outgunned, you know, by these people just so hard, and we've been desperately. You you know, I've got I've got interns here, I've got students here, we've got professors, and everybody's spending every minute just researching the history of H1N1 from the 2009 and the government response. We're looking at SARS-CoV-1 from 2003. What happened to the Boston Marathon thing? I don't even remember that. You know, they had a like one or two day lockdown there. Was that a test run? There's a lot of things. We have to research the history of, of, of disease, you know, dating all the way back to the beginning of modernity to figure out, you know, what is the relationship between human rights and the presence of pathogens? You know, what, what does that look like? Do we even have a philosophy to understand what that looks like? You know, as liberal libertarians, you know, I mean, like, are we prepared to live in the presence of pathogens and still acknowledge people's equal freedom and human rights? These are really important, profound questions that, that it's up to us to, to do. We are so behind. We are so behind. We are caught off guard. So we're trying frantically to catch up right now. Well, Jeffrey, we've already discussed a little bit uh, that you haven't necessarily been the best at making predictions. But regardless <laughs> of that, I want you to make some predictions because I'm curious where you see this all going. Uh, you did mention that you think there's going to be hell to pay, which you know makes yeah. me think, you know, are, are there going to actually be consequences for people that have been promoting this stuff, for people that have been pushing this stuff, that for people that have been shutting our lives down for most of this year? And yeah. where do you see all of this going? Because I, again, even if the government changes, it's really hard for me to picture right now, based on the the people that I see around me here, masks going away. I mean, maybe in certain parts of the country, in certain parts of the country, they, there are no masks, but here they're everywhere. And I, maybe this is going to be location by location based on the culture, but mm -hmm. I can't even imagine a world where I don't have to wear a mask going into a grocery yeah. store or going into a job. It does depend on where you, where you are. I have friends in Atlanta who say that everybody there is done with masks, obviously South South Dakota, Texas. My mother lives in Texas. She says that she rarely ever sees a mask. So it's, it's, it's all about media pressure. And once, once, 
once you know the scales fall from your eyes, once you realize, oh, this is a pathogen like like we've live among us all the time. Um, I, I think everybody's going to decompress really quickly. It's a lot of it's going to depend on the media, which could change here really quickly once uh, Biden, you know, is securely, uh, you know, president and and Trump's gone. We could see the media change, but even if it doesn't change, you know, it took twenty years for people to recognize the Iraq War was a catastrophe. You know, I don't think it's going to take that long for people to realize that uh, lockdowns catastrophe. I would give it, I would give it five years, which is not to say we're going to get any apologies, right? I mean, you're on social media. Has any of your friends who are pro lockdown in the early days apologized? I see it every once in a while. Oh no, they double down now. They double down, and even even the people who have reversed their position don't admit where they were before. So I don't think we can look forward to apologies. But the 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 amount of public anger is rising. Um, I would say about half the country is fed up and outraged. Okay, that's a little too extreme. It's probably closer to forty percent, and you see the, the, the you know Europe's under under a second lockdown, but they're riots in the streets today. In the UK, you've got uh, members of parliament now just making you know, denunciatory speeches. So it's getting really, really intense for the lockdowners right now. So I think this public pressure is only going to increase because there's no evidence whatsoever there's any relationship of disease, between disease mitigation and lockdowns, right? So that's a problem. It's unscientific. It's violating human liberty. And look, the reason we're libertarians is we don't believe that human beings should live in cages. It's just not in our nature. And we can maybe do it for a little while, but at some point we're going to wise up and realize I've got a life to live and these people shouldn't be allowed to take it away from me. I have to believe that. At heart, I'm still a populist, you know? I still believe that uh, there's goodness in people and people don't want to be slaves. It's true it can last a lot longer than you and I think it should, but I don't think it's good. You know, with the speed of information these days, I think this thing could unravel really, really quickly. Well, Jeffrey, despite your track record with predictions, uh, I hope you're right, because uh, I, I can't imagine that this can go only one of two ways. It can either just become a part of the culture where we all live in lockdown because there's always going to be some disease out there. There's always going to be a coronavirus or something else or the next thing. And if this is always the response to it, I don't even want to live in this world. I agree. Uh, but, but um, you know, ho hopefully it's the opposite. I mean, I do see senses of people, even people that aren't necessarily outraged about it. I do see people kind of just ignoring it a little bit more, just in my in my close friend circle, not so much the people I, I see in the neighborhood. But at some point when uh, people aren't dropping dead left and right, which has been the case the whole time, uh, maybe people will finally start to really say, hey, why are we not just living our lives? Why are we not being human? So I absolutely yeah. hope you're right. And I think that's why we need to be out there talking about this stuff and yeah. trying to persuade people. Uh, most people don't seem persuaded by evidence and, and logic and facts and charts. So we got to find some other ways and we got we to gotta work our persuasive magic with this. The other thing is to behave normally, right? I mean, like, mm -hmm. that's what I do. I try to live my life as normal as possible, you know? And and I hope that that inspires other people to kind of maybe think about doing the same thing. It's the weirdest thing I think I've ever said, but that's that's where we are today. <laughs> Well, Jeffrey, it's been, uh, been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, hopefully, you know, next time I, you, that you come back on here, uh, hopefully we'll be in a different world. Hopefully we won't be uh, living in lockdown land. Hopefully we'll li live in a place where people are actually functioning and interacting like normal human beings again. So we'll have to, we have, we've got it all on the record. We've got all your predictions and thoughts on the record. So we'll have to go back and take a look in a bit. But uh, before I let you, let you go, Jeffrey, just uh, do a quick little recap. Let everybody know about uh, the work you're doing over at AIER and of course how they can, uh, you know, find your book. Now, my listeners are pretty smart. They can probably figure out how to find your book, but uh, tell them a little bit about, about the book, Liberty or lockdown yeah the the book uh, liberty lockdown it came it came out right before the great Barrington declaration so it kind of takes us all the way up to like uh september something like that but it's called this a lot of the deeper research i talked to here and I, I think it's a good book it's getting really good reviews i write all the time for the american institute for economic research <clears throat> kind of uh, i guess you'd say head the editorial team although i'm just you know, one among many and everybody's working really hard here i, I can't stop tweeting jeffrey a tucker uh, so you can get me there and write me the stay in touch. And, and let me just congratulate you too. This is a really fun interview. So I oh, really appreciate you. it. I tried to have fun. It was, it was a really we fun. we got to have fun somehow nowadays. If I'm not yeah, allowed to go was, out to bars and, and have fun like, like that, yeah. I may as well just have fun sitting in my I, house. I really office, appreciate right? it. I, thanks so much for having me on. I really thanks, Jeffrey. It's been a blast. Keep up the great work. Keep on roaring. All right. All the best.
All right, Kitty Cats, I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Jeffrey Tucker. Uh, He has been one of the top voices out there speaking out against the lockdowns from the very beginning. Uh, So I really enjoyed talking to him about this stuff, even though it's not not exactly the most enjoyable topic, but it's a necessary one because this shit is goddamn ridiculous. I don't know how else to say it at this point. Uh, We need to be speaking out about against this stuff as much as possible. And Jeffrey, as well as uh, the other folks there at AIER, including our, our friend Phil Magnus, have been really the top voices out there, some of the top voices out there talking about the effects of lockdowns on people. And, you know, one of those effects uh, that we've talked about are hunger, hunger that has been killing people all around the world, uh, especially in third world countries where they're already having a hard time getting access to food and medicine. That's why we've been working with our friends at Donor C over the last few months, really since I think back in April, we've been donating 10% of our Patreon earnings to the projects that they have put in place to help people affected. Initially, they did it to help people affected by coronavirus, but once they realized that wasn't really the problem, they've now shifted their focus to help people affected by all the lockdowns around the world. Uh, We were recently able to fund a project helping to feed a young girl in Uganda who normally gets taken care of uh, by like a school that she usually goes to, but because of the lockdown, she hasn't been able to go go there. So they put together a care package for her uh, to be able to, you know, get her food, the food and supplies that she needs to get her through four months. Four months by just 10% of the the contributions of our patrons were able to change an entire life. Uh, Really, even a dollar or two, even if you're not a patron, I encourage you to head over to DonorC.com, specifically DonorC.com slash coronavirus uh, to uh, you know look at all the projects they're doing, trying to help people out there. Literally, a dollar or two does actually go a long way, believe it or not, especially in a lot of these countries where prices are a lot different. You can get a lot of food for a buck or two, believe it or not. So if you think, oh, I don't have a lot of money to give, uh, maybe, but y- you got to be able to afford a dollar. Almost, if you're listening to podcasts, you're probably someone that can afford an extra dollar. So don't give it to us. Well, give it to us. We'd like to We'd like you to give it to us too, of course. We'd like you to support your favorite libertarian podcast. But if you really only have a dollar to give, please do give it to our friends at Donor C because they are truly changing lives, doing amazing work over there. Uh, I will probably have Greg Glyer back on sometime before the end of the year uh, to talk more about this issue because it's, it's an issue that is not going to go away until we make it go away, until we will these lockdowns out of existence. And of course, joining the Pride has a lot of perks. Joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. You get more than just the the satisfying feeling knowing that some of your money is going to be helping our friends at Donor C, helping people around the world in need. You also get tons of exclusive bonus audio content. Uh, we have Conspiracy Corner, our monthly deep dive into various conspiracy theories. Uh, we have Degenerate Gamblers, where Brian, Odie, and Rico, uh, while they pregame for their little Bravo and beer show, talk about gambling, talk about liberty, tell crazy stories, all sorts of things like that, and tons of extra bonus content. Live streams that we do in the Facebook group, uh, the private Facebook group. You gotta check it out. Patreon dot com slash lions of liberty there are rewards and perks for everyone at every possible level you can imagine and of course you gotta check out our amazing merchandise over at lions of liberty dot store all patrons receive 20 percent off all that merchandise the holidays are coming up kids you gotta get on there and we've got a special deal for the end of the year i do not want to forget to mention this for the last two months until december 31st 2020 before 2021 if you join a patreon at the annual level we actually have annual memberships at every single level. Anybody who signs up will get two free months. That is insane. We are just giving this stuff away uh, to wrap up the year. Two free months. That's a 16% discount only running now until the end of the year. So if if there's ever a time to join the Patreon to support Lions of Liberty by joining the Pride, now is the time to do it. Two freaking free months. That is insane. Not only that, but anybody who joins at the equivalent of $15 a month or higher, at which point you get Howie Snowden's daily news links. Oh my God, you get like 100 plus news links specifically curated by our main man, Howie Snowden, the man who turned me on to the ideas of liberty oh so many eons ago. Uh, You get those every single day right in your inbox. Uh, But anybody who joins at that level or higher will get a free winter beanie, a free Lions of Liberty beanie. We'll toss that in there because why not? Because we love you. So please do check out patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. And don't forget to tune in this Wednesday as Brian returns with his weekly shot of comedy, culture, and liberty on Electric Liberty Land. And of course, you will wrap up the week as always with John Odermatt's weekly, hard-hitting, inspiring look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. He's been getting some insanely uh, amazing, exclusive interviews with people that are actually on death row. I think he just dropped the third one of those this past week, so you got to check those out. Those are interviews you are literally, quite literally, not going to hear anywhere else. That's why you got to smash that subscribe button. You don't want to miss a thing. Three shows a week for the price of one. That price is free, my friends. Until next time, live long! 
and live free. Anyone claiming that America's economy is in decline is peddling fiction. And libertarians are better Democrats than the Democrats and better Republicans than the Republicans. A Republican president, a Republican-controlled Congress, presided over the biggest expansion of government up to that point in history. And what's going to happen when they realize that Social Security is nothing but a racist, sexist, ageist, Ponzi scheme. I mean, how badly do you have to screw something up before we finally conclude that uh, maybe government can't solve this problem? The free market is the ultimate expression of democracy. I do the show two days a week. It's a free show. You sure you don't want to see some evidence to back up any of their claims before you get us into another war? Their entire existence is exploitative. Everything they eat, everything they drink, the roof over their heads. It was all paid for from theft at the threat of violence. Isn't it interesting that an education system run by the government somehow churns out a bunch of people who favor the government handling everything? That's the type of accounting that would get you thrown in prison if anybody else were to do it. But that's how the federal government operates. Black, white, Indian, Asian, rich, poor, short, tall, everybody benefits from freer markets. Libertarianism is principled, it's philosophically sound. In the arena of ideas, we cannot be defeated. This is the Peddling Fiction Podcast, the voice and soul of so-called fiction. Follow me on Twitter at Pedal Fiction. Download and subscribe, and no matter what happens, keep on peddling that so-called fiction. Peace.